thugs, parasites, terrorists, and secessionists. That's what the media has called the farmers who went on strike in India from October 2020 to February 2021. Why is it that when the media tries to smear the working class for getting organized, it sounds like a playground bully who just found their dad's thesaurus? But these are highly false accusations levied by the corporate and government-controlled media organizations. In order for them to be thugs, they'd have to be violent criminals committing violence for the sake of violence. But all the violence these protesters have faced have come from the police, and all they did was defend themselves. I mean, under capitalism, the only people that have the right to defend themselves are the oppressor, but I don't really see that as defending themselves. I see that as a, a temper tantrum. Most authoritarians are crybabies whose parents didn't teach them to respect others or have any sort of discipline in their life. The only type of government that would consider striking workers asking for better treatment and pay thugs is an authoritarian one. And the only media outlet that would refer to them as, as such is a propaganda outlet. Look... They're not parasites either because they're not leeching off of the system. If anything, capitalists are parasites leeching off of the labor of the working class to enrich themselves. And they're not terrorists considering they didn't cause mass destruction. And they're not disrupting, they're just trying to disrupt the status quo and daily life to call attention to their struggles, which are largely going ignored by the mass populace. They're not secessionists because they're not trying to secede from India. They want India to be a place where people can thrive doing what they want to do and love to do. These farmers are fighting for their right to live a good life. That doesn't mean that they're trying to form a whole new country, but rather create a country worth living in. These farmers are pushing back against neoliberal policies that would lead to corporations and big agricultural industries to come in and take their land. There are three laws specifically that were introduced in September 2020 that have major impacts to Indian agriculture. They dismantle decades of work done to improve the agricultural sector in India. And the, the justifications for these laws are trying to revise the history of neoliberalism in India. To understand the importance of the strike, we have to go back to the 50s after partition and British rule. At that time, India was primarily focused on uh, its efforts of industrialization by building more dams and irrigation systems, that sort of stuff, but neglected to bolster its agricultural sector. Even then, a majority of the jobs were in agriculture. But who cares? I mean, it's just food, right? Uh, you know, and the rich have heard uh, that peasants don't really need to eat. Uh, you know, you just give them a couple squirts of oil and they'll be fine. Wait, wait. That's robots. Okay, they, the, okay the rich are thinking about robots. They've confused workers for robots. It's a common mistake. Very common mistake. Look, the industrial sector did help increase job opportunities, but this caused an increase in food demands, and since agriculture wasn't a focus, India had to import grains in order to prevent a nationwide famine. India decided to go to the World Bank and the United States to get help. The U.S. had been sending grains to India, but India's foreign exports fund was running low. They paid the U.S. in Indian rupees so that they wouldn't go further into debt. And the U.S. had to provide them with grains and food under Public Law 480. But the U.S. saw an opportunity to get India to change its policies. Look, as a Christian nation, America can't pass up an opportunity to exploit. Okay, that's, that's probably one of the commandments, right? Thou shall exploit those in need. That's, that's probably in there, right? That's a lot of what Jesus talked about. Jesus went around and he was like, look, if you see somebody in need, you exploit the shit out of them to get money. It's not like he went to a bank, you know, where money changers were exploiting the poor and beat the shit out of them. No, that that part of the Bible is is uh, 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 has been rewritten to, to show uh, Jesus high fiving those money changers 
And he said, yeah, that you guys are fucking nailing it. And you know what would be really cool is if you guys started um, wearing suits, worshipping a bull that represents capitalism, uh, and doing a fuckload of cocaine. That's... That's all in the. That's all in somebody's Bible, I think. Right? I think everybody kind of has like a personalized version of uh, of a Bible, and I'm sure that's probably that's probably in there somewhere in somebody's Bible. But India's wars with China and Pakistan in the early '60s and a drought shrank those foreign reserves even more, proving again that wars are a huge waste of money and human lives. Instead of waging wars, they could have spent that money improving agricultural technology and feeding their citizens. And at this point, America was sending India less grain than they needed, and it was low-quality grain to boot. The quality was good enough to feed chickens, but not humans. Then if there's one thing you can say about America is they are consistently racist, huh? Even when they're trying to be humanitarian, they are racist racist. I mean, you really got to appreciate that tenacity, you know. Now, in order to receive help from America and the World Bank, then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi made a deal to lift import curbs, deregulate a variety of industries, allow U.S. fertilizer production, and devalued the Indian rupee by 57 percent. And then the United States and the World Bank looked at India and said, new phone, who dis? Yeah, they went back on their deal and didn't hold up their end of the bargain, furthering India into debt and causing their economy to crash. I mean, much like a selfish lover, America got to the finish line, and when it was India's turn, America was already putting their, its pants back on. But it did leave India with some cab fare. And, and, and not, not enough for, like, a, a whole cab ride but but a little bit but a little it would get them down the street you know maybe around the around the uh, the 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 corner there but uh, look america was on its way to fuck the middle east whether the middle east wa- had had given its consent or not okay Clearly, foreign aid wasn't going to come anytime soon. The U.S. had bailed on them, and at this point, the U.K. was pretty sore over, you know, losing their plans for global domination. In order to help improve the lives of smaller farmers across India, the country nationalized 14 private banks, which were then able to offer loans and credits to farmers to purchase new technologies needed to keep up with larger farms. This increased the yield for farmers and therefore feed the people of India. This allowed the government to subsidize the private fertilizer manufacturers who then passed on those discounts to the farmers. In in 1960, the minimum support price, or MSP, was set so farmers wouldn't lose money on crops. The MSP covers the cost of cultivation and ensures that farmers get a reasonable income and is facilitated via the Food Corporation of India. The government then sells the food grains through the public distribution system, which makes it easier for lower classes to get their foods. And they also hold excess grains in storage, so Indians would have food during a low-yield year as well. I mean, for a brief moment, it seemed that India had learned its lessons from the previous decade. Now, in order to prevent traders from undercutting and not paying farmers, states set up the Agricultural Produce Marketing Committees to regulate these yards and ensure that traders were meeting at least the MSP for the farmers. The more market yards there are, the better it was for smaller farmers since their transportation costs would be less. Now, politicians saw empowering the rural communities and the working class as a danger that would lead to, to them moving up the caste system. They, they very quietly feared the rise of communism and socialism in India, even though it was socialism that saved the country. So in order to create divide within the peasantry, they empowered some of the rich peasants with government bank credits, and the smaller farms were forced to go to exploitative money lenders and this put these small farmers in a debt trap to get new farming technology to keep up with some of the bigger farms by the 90s india made deals with the international monetary fund or the imf 
and the World Bank again. If the IMF sounds familiar, it's because they're the gangster monetary organization that paid former Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno $4 billion bounty to illegally remove Julian Assange from the asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy in the United Kingdom. This deal deregulated banks, crushing a majority of public banks that were helping the smaller farmers stay out of debt, and ensured that the Indian working class would be the victims of the failures of capitalism. I realize I, I need to do a little bit of clarification here. The deal I'm talking about is India's deal with the IMF and the World Bank, not Lenin Moreno's deal with the IMF to turn over Julian Assange to the British authorities to get extradited to the United States. That, that, that caused a different chain reaction of things. In 1995, India joins the World Trade Organizations, which pitted the small farmers against the large agribusiness of the more industrialized nations who were receiving subsidies from the Indian government. This led to companies like Monsanto, known for creating suicide seeds, to buy up and run out smaller farmers who would then commit suicide. So Monsanto is really just a corporation whose product is suicides. Right? I mean, capitalism will find a way to put a dollar sign on anything and everything. This created an aggregation crisis and led to starvation, the likes of which that hadn't been seen since the British rule of India. So in less than 100 years after India gained its independence, they partnered with a new imperial force and repeated the cycle of classes and poverty and suffering caused by an, an invading foreign force. Great job, everyone. Yeah. yeah, who needs sovereignty and freedom when they have a globally dominating imperial force crushing rights nonstop that you can partner with? In the early 2000s, the government did decide to enhance welfare and the well-being of farmers and their workers. They implemented a rural employment guarantee program, which promised at least 100 days of work for agricultural workers and provided funds to improve agricultural technology and increase water tables in regions that were prone to drought. This was the first time in decades farmers' incomes rose by 8%. But don't worry, the Indian government in cahoots with private industries displaced these farmers and rural communities to control agriculture, minerals, and forest communities. Okay, they, and they did this through fraud and non-payment schemes concocted by privatized banks, which made industrialists like Mukesh Ambani a billionaire overnight. It, it's kind of funny. You, you know, we, we, never, we never see the working class scheming as much. You know, we're, we're all just trying to live our best lives and create a bright future for the next generations. But the rich, like real-life Bond villains, are cooking up plans and schemes in a back room somewhere. You know, if they use that energy for positive means, we'd likely eradicate poverty and suffering as we know it. But, but no, 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 no. We need to have a dick-measuring contest about who can cause the most amount of suffering on the planet. Yeah, and then they have the balls to talk about productivity. Well, all this brings us to the Modi government, who destabilized the rural communities even more by demonetizing 80% of currency in India and implementing a goods and service tax uh, that impacted farmers over to the traders. And all of this has culminated to the new set of laws pushed by the Modi government to deregulate the traders, remove the MSP, and remove foods like potatoes, onions, and pulses from the essential foods list. Look, if you've ever eaten in an Indian restaurant, then you know that these are pretty much essential vegetables that you need to make about 98% of Indian dishes. Okay, these laws are not only disrupting the livelihoods of these farmers, but they're also disrupting our fucking taste buds. Okay, laws like this are going to make Indian food as bland as English or American foods, which, which might be the plan all along. You know, spices, really, once you have spices in your system, you know, you, you just, you want to start the revolution. That's, that's what you really do. Look, all foods are essential. It's a, it's a basic need, okay? And laws like this are trying to control that. Propaganda pushed forward by neoliberal, neo-fascist elites 
always try to downplay and hide their own history of atrocities. These farmers in India have had to deal with these types of politicians for decades. They are the lifeblood of India. They're quite literally feeding the nation. Instead of propping them up, these elites have used economics as a way to control and limit their growth. Capitalism is touted as a system that saves lives, but India is proof that it doesn't. It created more famine and led to more suicides than any other economic system on the planet. Thugs, parasites, terrorists, and secessionists are all terms that are applicable to capitalists, but not to striking farmers. And that has been your dispatch for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please make sure you hit that like button, that share button, and get the word out about these uh, these topics. These are, are topics that are not going to be addressed in corporate mainstream media. In fact, they are likely to be ignored uh, or smeared on corporate mainstream media, so independent media of any kind, whether it's uh, comedy commentators, uh, people that break down the news, people that do commentary on other content creators, uh, real journalists that are going you know, to, to different countries to, to expose corruption and to, to get the stories on the ground. All of these people are part of independent media, and, uh, and we very much depend on uh, you guys, the audience, to help us out by sharing this in any which way that you can, by hitting that share button and, and th throwing it up on your social media, uh, by emailing this to, to your friends and family, by texting this to people that you think would need to know this, um, and generally trying to start a conversation around these topics, to have some discourse around these topics. Um, and uh, and I want to say a, a, a big, big thank you to, to everybody that uh, does share these videos and podcasts on a pretty regular basis um, and has contributed to become a, a sustaining member uh, of my work to to help uh, you know help, help me make this my full-time job again um, you know I, I, I want to say a big thank you to the to the people that have uh, have done that as well Hopefully that uh, I've got my live virtual comedy shows back in action and the very last Friday of every single month. They happen at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Tickets are $10. And every month, it's a brand new show covering a brand new sociopolitical topic that you won't hear on corporate mainstream networks. And as a bonus, uh, some months you might get to hear a weird, quirky story from me related to the topic of discussion. Or there might be a special guest joining the show. These are musicians, storytellers, comedians, activists, so on and so forth. Uh, they they will be uh, kicking off the show uh, with a with a set at the at the top, and then it'll lead right into the socio political commentary. Uh, and look, if ten bucks is a is a little bit too expensive, I totally understand. Shoot me a message or an email. And I will make sure that you get a ticket to come check out the show via Zoom. Uh, secondly, if you want to uh, financially contribute to the show and you are on stable financial ground, you can do so at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A dot com slash donate. The biggest way you can help is by becoming a sustaining member, make monthly contributions, uh, which means that you get free tickets to the virtual comedy shows that I just talked about and the live ones when the live ones come back. Uh, you also get early access to a certain Forkful of Noodles videos. You get to ask me questions, which I'll then respond to either in live streams uh, standalone videos or as a segment on the virtual comedy shows that I do and then those will be released as premium exclusive content just for the members uh, you get uh, addition, bonus stand up comedy and storytelling content so tons of things for becoming a uh, sustaining member but if sustaining membership isn't in your cards, you can also make a one-time donation as well. And um, I have now included a statement of transparency, which lets you know exactly what you're contributing to um, and what you're helping me uh, uh, achieve, what goals you're helping me achieve by becoming a sustaining member, by, by, by getting me one step closer to making this my full-time job again. It, 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 be doing comedy full-time and creating content full-time was my full, uh, was my job full uh, pre-pandemic, but uh, because of the the way the world is now, um, 
I'm unable to do that without uh, without the do without donations from you guys, from the people. And lastly, I want to mention that I do have a online merch store. That's right, I've got uh, t-shirts, I've got mugs, hoodies, you name it, it's there, probably, kind of. Uh, but <laughs> it's available on my website, krishmohanhaha.com. Uh, it's the merch tab. And uh, there, all of the designs have been made by me. There's seven designs uh, on the site right now, but that's due to probably go up. I'll probably make newer designs and release them as, as, as time goes on. Um, but there's a Julian Assange shirt that's available right now, and I'm going to donate 100% of all of the profits made from that shirt to pro-Assange um, groups and journalists and activists uh people like action for assange right uh kevin gasola richard medhurst folks like that uh i'm gonna make my donations to them um so so if you want to help um you know people that are covering assange uh hit the spotlight a little bit more then then grab that shirt because i'm donating all of that to them uh, and last but not least, you can grab all of my stand-up comedy albums directly off of my Bandcamp at krishmohanhaha.bandcamp.com. My albums are available for a pay-what-you-want uh, price range on Bandcamp, but if you just want to listen to them and you don't want to, you know, have them take up room in your computer, I totally get it. Uh, you can also stream them off of Pandora. It's available on iTunes and, uh, uh you google play all of the all of the ways that you listen to music uh with all that said and done uh thank you guys for tuning into the show thank you guys for being regular listeners to the show i very much appreciate it and thank you to all the people that do donate irregularly and have become sustaining members because uh i wouldn't be able to continue doing this without you guys so you guys really make this uh possible and i am very 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 appreciative of that 